So this is Audrey Owens. Um, thank you for uh, that introduction and thank you for inviting us to give this presentation today. Um, Kat Crawford, um, who works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and is the lead for Chair Call Up for Frogs, was actually going to be giving the first part of this talk and I was going to kind of tag team towards the second half, but because this talk is starting early, she's not available. So I'm just going to um, give the entire presentation and if she comes in later and, uh, and she wants to take over, that would be fine. Um, but yeah, are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So this talk is going to be on Chiricahua leopard frog recovery. It's going to have a focus on Arizona because um, I work for Arizona Game and Fish, and so that's you know my level of expertise. Um, but we are going to um, the things that we're talking about do apply to New Mexico as well, and so we're going to kind of go through um, the initial decline of the species, what we've done to help recover it. Um, and uh, what challenges remain in the recovery program. So just a little bit of background first. The Chiricahua leopard frog rana or Lithobates chiricoensis is found in the southwestern U.S. You can see on the map um, the distribution is in pink. So it's found, it's actually got kind of two populations, a northern population and a southern population. And that northern population is found in mm -hmm. Um, Arizona and New Mexico along a big escarpment called the Mogollon Rim. And then it's found in southern Arizona and southwestern New Mexico, and then the northern part of Mexico in uh, the Sierra Madre Oriental, Chihuahua, and then the Central and Eastern Sonora. And they're kind of a mineral elevation species. So they can be found from 1,000 meters to about 2,700 meters elevation. And the species was named after the Chiricahua Mountains, which are found in southeastern Arizona, the extreme southeastern corner of Arizona, because that is where the holotype was collected in 1971. So this slide is just kind of showing you the, um, the diversity in what this species looks like. So they're a pretty stout bodied frog. Um, they get to about four inches maximum size and um, they are green with brown spots or brown with green spots and you can see really prominent upturned eyes and uh, both So part of their natural history, you know, like a lot of amphibians, they live in metapopulations, so multiple small um, subpopulations that are separated geographically, although those subpopulations um, in order to be a functioning metapopulation need to be connected via either proximity or drainage. So, you know, through um, riparian habitat that connects them. And dispersal is an important component of a functioning metapopulation for Chiricahua leopard frogs so they can move from one population to another. Um, and this is particularly important given that a lot of our um, natural habitat, particularly in Arizona, um, has been fragmented and our riparian systems um, may no longer hold permanent water. So in this slide, I'm just showing some of the different types of habitat that Chiricahua leopard frogs um, do inhabit. So top left photo is an actual old concrete stock tank. Um, top right, obviously, is a natural system with a, a plunge pool. Um, and then the bottom three, or excuse me, the bottom um, two on the left are both um, uh, different types of cattle waters. So we've got a steel rim tank on the bottom left, and then in the middle is an earthen stock tank. And I'll be referring to this type of habitat throughout this presentation. And then in the bottom right is a habitat that we created um, uh, artificially. So it's a spring um, that is there naturally that we have allowed to move into kind of a wetland situation. Threats to the Chiricahua leopard frog include um, invasive species, so non-native predators and competitors. Bullfrogs are a major threat because they not only compete with Chiricahua leopard frogs, they also eat them. Um, they also can spread disease, obviously. Um, crayfish also um, 
compete with Chiricahua upper frogs for food and also prey on um, eggs and tadpoles and then green sunfish, same thing, um, predators on the species. Pitcher fungus, uh, another threat the species is susceptible to BD. We began to see substantial declines um, in the 70s. We know it was in the Southwest as early as 1972. And at this point, we consider it throughout the entire range of the Chiricahua leopard frog. In the Southwest, it is a winter phenomenon. So in the summer, you know, the water is, is warm and we don't see really too many die-offs in the summer, but we do see localized die-offs um, in the winter time. We do know that some populations of Chiricahua leopard frogs persist with BD, and that is in Arizona as well as New Mexico. So another threat is habitat degradation and loss. So water diversion and pumping, this is of course a problem in a lot of places in the Southwest. So just loss of our natural riparian habitat. Um, wildfire is another big one because of the effects of um, erosion and sedimentation into those natural waterways. Drought also compounds all of that. Um, and you know, other things like development and mining operations can all act towards um, fragmenting um, habitat on the ground and disrupting dispersal. So yeah, the reason you know, these threats are important um, for the species is because they do act on disrupting metapopulation dynamics. So they limit recruitment, they limit dispersal, and already small localized po populations are going to be more susceptible to extirpation. Um, also, you know, having um, non-native species at a site um, can create sink populations. So, you know, bullfrogs or, uh, or crayfish or green sunfish are preventing recruitment. And um, even though we might have adults there, um, we're not getting um, any recruitment. And so it's the creation of sink populations. So the species was um, listed in 2002. There were significant declines range-wide, um, again, starting in the 70s, 80s, and through the 90s. And by 2002, at the time of listing, they were absent from more than 80% of their historic localities. And so they are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So just kind of going through some of the listing history, the proposed rule was published in 2000. And again, the final rule was published in 2002. So at that point, they were listed as a threatened species with no critical habitat. The recovery plan was published in 2007. And this is really what we use as the blueprint for recovery of the species. So it outlines the recovery strategy, the recovery criteria, and it delineates the recovery unit which are kind of those on the ground geographical areas where we do management. Critical habitat for the species came in 2012 and critical habitat included areas that were occupied at that time or were essential for supporting Chiricahua leopard frogs in their habitat. And so it really delineated those areas that are key for the protection of the species. So the goal of the recovery plan is obviously recovery and delisting eventually. Um, and it outlines multiple strategy elements. So reducing threats, maintaining, restoring, and creating habitat, doing translocations, getting outreach and education out there so people know about the species and know what the threats are, monitoring, research and along with research goes adaptive management so we can have flexibility in how we manage for the species. And this recovery plan was really a collaborative effort among many, many partners. And this slide is just showing you some of the partners. There were uh, more than this, but um, these were some of the main players. So, you know, really it um, was many technical experts, um, zoos and other captive facilities, museums, governmental agencies at all levels. Um, and then we also had a lot of, um, you know, private citizens and ranchers at the table. Um, and these folks and entities are 
um, many of them still major players in the recovery of the species um, today. So those recovery units, there are eight of them throughout the range of the species. And these were delineated to ensure that the species would be well distributed throughout the range, um, you know, when and if it is recovered. And this was important because we wanted to maintain um, genetic diversity within and among recovery units. And so we kind of thought about genetic diversity from that recovery unit standpoint. Um, and these geographical areas really promote local conservation because we have meetings associated with those recovery units and those folks at the meeting are the ones that are doing the work on the ground. So this map is showing um, the range of the Chiricahua leopard frog and so you, again you see that northern range and the southern range and um, uh, the different colored polygons are each recovery unit so there are eight recovery units. Um, there are four in the southern portion of the range and then there are three in the northern portion of the range. And so Arizona has recovery units one through seven and uh, Mexico has recovery units one, two, and three or portions of it and then New Mexico has um, portions of six, seven, and eight. And then the black borders that you see within those recovery units are management areas. And so those really are the, you know, on the ground areas where we've um, really at least initially focused our, our recovery work. So the recovery plan outlined four recovery criteria um, that need to be met in order for the species to be delisted. So each recovery unit must have at least two metapopulation, uh, metapopulations and those need to be in different drainages, plus at least, at least one isolated robust population. And that isolated robust population was um, important at the time of the recovery plan because they wanted to ensure that the population was isolated and wouldn't get BD or other potential diseases. And so it was kind of like a refuge site. Um, and these populations must exhibit long-term persistence and stability based on a scientifically acceptable monitoring program. Um, second rec recovery criteria um, is uh, protection and management of aquatic breeding habitats um, and then protection and management of dispersal habitat, so ensuring that there are corridors and frogs can move from one subpopulation to another, and then um, the reduction or elimination of threats. So management decisions for the species are made kind of on two levels. So there's a steering committee, which is kind of the higher level management decision. And we do have an Arizona steering committee and a New Mexico steering committee. And in, um, uh, in New Mexico, that steering committee has really operated also like a local recovery group meeting, which um, is where the partners that are like on the ground doing the work are talking about, you know, where they are um, in that particular year and where they need to go next year as far as translocations and things like that. Um, but in Arizona, we do have a separate local recovery group meeting, which is based on the recovery unit. Um, and again, that's where those, you know, governmental or um, non-governmental folks are, who are actually the ones, you know, doing the monitoring or habitat restoration work can get together and talk about um, what the status is of that particular population. So for the next part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about um, recovery tools. And these, again, were all laid out in that recovery plan. And so this is, you know, what we're doing on the ground that has been um, successful or at least somewhat successful in increasing populations. So um, you know, initially when the species was listed in 2002, um, and, and even a little bit before that, um, when we knew the species was declining, a lot of the work that we were doing was really triage. How could we increase populations on the ground, um, or at least stop declines? And so that's where captive propagation came in. And um, 
through capital cultivation, we've been working to augment or establish wild populations, both in Arizona and New Mexico. So frogs, tadpoles, and egg masses have been propagated in various captive or semi-captive facilities. In Arizona, we work uh, really closely with the Phoenix Zoo, and we have since the mid-90s, actually. Um, in New Mexico, um, the Ladder Ranch, which is managed by the Turner Endangered Species Fund, has been a major source of um, kind of captive or semi-captive facilities, um, and as well as um, uh, semi-captive semi or, or semi-wild sites on BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land, and Forest Service land. And so these have been sources for um, head starting and propagation of um, of tadpoles and egg masses. And you know, since we've um, been able to um, work more towards um, you know, increasing the number of populations on the ground, we have um, also begun to use wild-to-wild -wild egg mass releases. So moving an egg mass from one wild site to another in order to reestablish a population or augment a population. Now I don't have um, release numbers for New Mexico, but in Arizona since, um, since 2002, actually probably since the mid 90s, we have released um, 406, we've done 406 releases at 148 sites. And this includes um, over 30,000 tadpoles, um, nearly 18,000 frogs and 181 egg masses. And this includes both those animals that have come from the Phoenix Zoo and other captive facilities, and also wild-to-wild -wild translocations. So the recovery tool that we've been using is bullfrog control, particularly in Southern Arizona. In the last 10 years, as we've moved away from the need to really do a whole lot of triage, for conservation of the species, we've been able to do other approaches that allow us to increase populations of Chiricahua leopard frogs on the ground. And such approaches include removal of threats, bullfrogs being a major threat in southern Arizona, um, which is an area that would otherwise be suitable habitat for Chiricahua leopard frogs. So bullfrog removal started on a small scale at specific sites in the early 2000s. But in the last 10 years, our partners have been doing more large-scale efforts that span across the three recovery units in Southern Arizona. And I want to point out that the approach that we take for bullfrog uh, control is not eradication, which would probably be impossible in Southern Arizona given the extent of bullfrogs. Um, instead, we do removal and control in an area that would be suitable for and so we delineate a removal area and then draw a line around that, which represents a buffer zone. And outside of that buffer zone, we may not have control over the landscape because of private land or other access issues where we're not able to remove bullfrogs from outside of that buffer zone. And so we assess the topography, we assess available water on the landscape, and that lets us know where there might be dispersal corridors for bullfrogs and where there might be source populations where we've got lots of adults that are breeding. And um, after successful of removal from bullfrogs from an area, we can then focus our um, efforts on monitoring that buffer zone. So um, we can remove any bullfrogs that might be dispersing from outside of the buffer zone. And we have specific removal techniques based on the situation. So for breeding adults and juveniles, we tend to use shooting and hand, hand capture at night. And by shooting, we use um, either pellet guns or 22 rifles. And for tadpoles, we use staining. And that's what you see in the photo on the bottom left. So we're, we're able to literally remove hundreds of thousands of tadpoles from a site using staining over and over again. And the adult removal and juvenile removal tends to really happen in the dry season when pinks when these earthen stock tanks are low in water, um, and that also prevents them from moving during the rainy season. The staining can be doing can be done any time of year, um, but we do tend to focus on that in the fall or winter 
so that we can prevent recruitment in the spring. And so this effort has really involved many, many partners and many funding sources. Um, so it's an incredible amount of coordination. Um, and then we also have to coordinate with ranchers and private landowners, and it's really a big outreach effort to get folks on board with this. And the funding um, in Southern Arizona has in large part come from um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, U.S. Geological Survey, the University of Arizona, uh, U.S. Forest Service, and Arizona Game and Fish. But really remarkably, we've seen success of bullfrog removal in several key areas in Southern Arizona. So when we've been able to successfully remove Chiricahua leopard frogs, Chiricahua, uh, excuse me, when we've been able to successfully remove bullfrogs, Chiricahua leopard frogs have been able to recolonize because they've been kind of in, you know, small populations on the periphery. And so they move in on their own, they disperse, you know, nearly 10 miles to recolonize sites that were previously occupied by bullfrogs. So I wanted to talk about a particular case study of bullfrog removal that we began in 2009. This is in southern Arizona, so it's in the vicinity of Pina Blanca Lake, which is what you see in the center um, of the yellow circle. And so Pina Blanca Lake uh, was full of bullfrogs, and as were many of the stock tanks in the vicinity of the lake. And so the black dots are stock tanks that, um, that were not occupied by bullfrogs. The red ones are stock tanks that were occupied by bullfrogs. And so in 2009, the Forest Service drained Pina Blanca Lake in order to remove uh, mercury, which was contaminating the fishery at the site. And so because the lake was going to be dry, the bullfrogs would be removed. We used that as an opportunity to really make a concerted effort to remove removal frogs from the tanks in the surrounding area. So it took about two years to remove bullfrogs from this landscape. And at this point, um, here we are 10 years later, um, we do monitor that buffer zone around the lake, which is what you see with the yellow line. This is um, a 10 mile diameter area. And we have a source population of bullfrogs that comes out from the Northeast because there's, there's a town there with golf courses and other private properties. And that area is connected um, potentially to Pina Blanca Lake by a drainage. And so what you see with the red triangle is actually a tank on private property that we monitor uh, three times a year to look for bullfrogs and remove any that might come in there so that they don't reinvade our removal area. And we work with a private landowner there who is really generous in allowing us to go there several times a year. So the distribution of Chiricahua leopard frogs in this area prior to the removal of bullfrogs is what you see on this map. It's those green dots. So we had seven sites that were occupied by Chiricahua leopard frogs, and three of those were also um, co-occupied by bullfrogs, and those are the ones that are outlined in red. So amazingly, after bullfrogs were removed, Chiricahua leopard frogs first on their own. And so this next slide shows you that following removal of bullfrogs, Chiricahua leopard frogs dispersed again nearly 10 miles and colonized 20 sites on the landscape. And so this is really showing the if you build it, they will come model of, um, of conservation and management. This is not through any translocations or reintroductions that we did. This is just moving bullfrogs out of the area. And so we have found that, you know, bullfrog removal is a lot of work, but it's well worth the cost given that the leopard frogs can repatriate sites on their own if there are still a few remaining in the area. So habitat restoration is another uh, tool that we use that was outlined in the recovery plan. And so I mentioned before, you know, a lot of our, our natural waters um, have been dewatered on the landscape, and um, that's particularly true in Arizona. So these earthen stock tanks can provide suitable habitat for Chiricahua leopard frogs um, because they're abundant on the landscape and they're widely distributed. And this is, you know, the case if as long as they're free of non-natives, 
if they hold permanent water, and if they're part of a larger network of interconnected habitats. So in 2011, we began partnering with uh, Wetlands Restoration and Training, um, which is uh, a company that does, that creates and restores wetlands across the U.S. And um, we have re restored over two dozen of these um, earthen tanks or wetlands um, on the landscape, mostly in Southern Arizona. And in doing so, we've increased the permanency of these waters and increased the complexity, making them better habitat for Chiricahua leopard frogs. And um, we do um, these restorations in the dry season, right before it starts raining. So I wanna point out that, you know, it is a construction site. There's heavy machinery, there's a lot of earth moving. It's not something that's pretty while it's going on. Um, but because we do it in the dry season, when it's done, the rains start, um, the tanks fill back up with water and the vegetation regrows quickly. And so we've found these to be a valuable investment because we have been increased in the permanency of water on the landscape. So this is a particular um, habitat restoration that we did in 2018. So last year, this is Carroll Springs. And this actually is not in Southern Arizona. This is in the Northern population um, of the species in, in uh, Arizona. So Carroll Springs was a site that did have multiple springs, which were really no longer functioning. And the site was really a stronghold for the species in recovery unit five. We had a breeding population of frogs there that we were able to bring in into individuals from the site to the zoo for captive propagation. And we were able to use egg masses from the site for wild to wild um, translocations. Um, but as of 2016, because of really heavy erosion um, and cattle trespass into the site, um, we no longer had any um, surface water. So in 2018, we worked with wetland restoration and training to renovate the site. Um, and so they were able to create um, three pools, three permanent pools within this um, riparian corridor. And um, they did that with the use of, of one liner. And then they also used existing clay and rock at the site to create um, these underground dam structures. And so um, as of uh, 2018, after the renovation, we released Chiricahua leopard frogs back into the site. And as of this year, um, you can see the picture on the right shows one of the pools here. And we have a breeding population of Chiricahua leopard frogs back on the landscape. Safe harbor agreements are another tool that we've been employing um, here in Arizona. Um, so basically a private landowner um, signs on to this agreement and the agreement is with Game and Fish and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the private landowner agrees to specific conservation measures that benefit the frog. And so in some cases it's you know simply allowing us access to monitor um, in other cases, they take a more active role and allow us to do releases onto their property. And in exchange, they get protection from incidental take regulations. And so this really reduces concerns among private landowners about recovery actions for the species, the fact, the fact that they um, have a, you know, a listed species on their property. And we've used these safe harbors for varying roles, depending on what habitat exists on the property. So they might be a refuge population where we want to protect a particular genetic lineage. Um, they might be a nursery where we go and we know we can get reliable egg masses for translocation. Um, they might be a subpopulation within a larger metapopulation, or they might be um, a protected dispersal corridor, again, within a metapopulation. So as of now, we have um, 26 participants within our safe harbor program in Arizona with over 46,000 acres enrolled. Um, and New Mexico is currently working on their safe harbor for private lands um, within the recovery units in New Mexico. Another recovery tool that's kind of similar to um, the safe harbor is what's called the 4D rule. So this is a rule under the Endangered Species Act. 
and it applies to private, state, and tribal lands. So it exempts, exempts operations and maintenance of these earthen cattle tanks on these non-federal lands from take prohibitions. So basically, if a rancher wants to clean out the tank on their property um, to increase permanency of water for the cattle, we recognize that in doing so, that rancher is also restoring habitat for Chiricahua leopard frogs that might be in the area or on that particular property. And so they do not have to be concerned about take prohibitions um, if they're doing that because they're maintaining habitat for the species. And so this is another way that we've been able to reduce concerns from ranchers um, when it comes to recovery and conservation of listed species. So monitoring isn't really a recovery tool, but it is something that was outlined in the recovery plan. And we do have standardized um, visual encounter surveys that we use um, throughout Arizona and New Mexico. And they are um, essentially presence absence surveys. And the information that we get from these surveys can document the presence of Chiricahua leopard frogs, um, document if reproduction is occurring at a site, documenting dispersals, so going to a site that was previously not occupied, um, but then became occupied through dispersal. We also document the um, condition of habitat at a site, and, um, and then also emerging threats. You know, we might um, encounter uh, mortality from BD or encounter a new invasive species at that particular site. So in Arizona and New Mexico, um, we have been administering a Chiricahua leopard frog workshop um, annually. And in Arizona, we've been doing it since 2002. So participants learn about Chiricahua leopard frog biology and conservation, as well as how to perform the visual encounter surveys. And the workshop certifies them to perform these surveys, and um, it allows them to then apply for their state and federal permits to do those surveys. So along with monitoring is you know, data collection and data management. And um, here in Arizona, we have a centralized database that um, we've had since um, probably the mid to late 90s. And at this point, we have over 12,000 surveys within our database. And importantly, inc it includes negative surveys as well. So we can look at the status of a site over time, looking at you know, um, how its occupancy changes. And these data are used by our local recovery groups to make decisions about where we want to be improving habitat or where we want to be addressing particular threats. We use it for our annual reporting. The steering committee, um, so that higher level um, decision-making group uses it for tracking progress towards recovery and those recovery criteria. And then, um, you know, governmental agencies use it for project evaluation. So addressing um, whether projects might um, impact, um, adversely impact Chiricahua leopard frogs or their habitat. So our current status um, since listing, um, which was 17 years ago um, at this point is that, um, well, it's, it's complicated, <laughs> um, but in Arizona, populations have benefited greatly from active management from the state and many partners that we have here. In New Mexico, there have been fewer resources available for active management, um, and disease issues have affected their populations really drastically. So in Arizona, overall, our populations have been improving. In New Mexico, there has still been declining populations, but because there have been more surveys done since the time of listing, new populations have been found. And so that's kind of offset the decline in other populations in the state. And then we do not know what the status is of the species in Mexico. So I wanted to show you um, the status of Arizona's populations um, on a map here. So this is Arizona um, across um, four different years since the time of listing. 
and the red boundaries that you see are those recovery units. And so in 2002, at the time of listing, we knew of 26 sites that were occupied. In 2008, we had 40 sites that we knew of that were occupied. In 2012, we had 96 sites. And as of 2018, we have 156 sites. So this is a five-fold increase in the number of occupied sites since listing. So this suggests that recovery is on track here. Um, the majority of this success has been since the recovery plan implementation um, in 2007. And so it's directly related to the large number of partners and stakeholders at the table um, during the creation of the recovery plan. And I also want to reiterate that um, this increase in population is really a combination of captive propagation and releases, um, wild to wild translocations, bullfrog removal, which has allowed for dispersal of existing Chiricahua leopard frog populations and expansion. Um, and it's been facilitated by increasing permanent water on the landscape and the use of private lands. So um, I also wanted to give you a case study of how frog releases from a captive facility have been successful in creating a functioning metapopulation um, here in Arizona. So the red outline is the outline of recovery unit four, which is in southeastern Arizona. And these maps um, show you the Galuro Mountains, which are in recovery unit four. And so each map is the same, you know, geographical area. And Chiricahua leopard frogs were considered extirpated or nearly extirpated in the Galuro Mountains. And between 2012 and 2014, we did um, a handful of releases into one particular um, stock tank. Um, and we released just over 300 frogs and five egg masses into the stock tank over the course of, I think, four releases. And so the map on the top left, 2012, shows you um, occupancy at that one site that we did the releases. By 2013, they had dispersed to a second site. Um, by 2014, they dispersed to um, a total of five sites. And again, these are um, earthen stock tanks. And so these frogs were moving over land or possibly through intermittent drainages. Um, so, you know, maybe creeks that are dry most of the year except for the monsoon season when it's raining. So as of now in 2018, or at least, you know, last year's status, um, the frogs had dispersed to 26 sites, um, both north and south of that original release site. And this is a span of 15 kilometers um, north and south that they've moved. So each year we also document new breeding sites in this metapopulation. And um, unfortunately, 2019 has been a very dry monsoon across um, uh, Arizona. And so I believe that a lot of these sites that have been occupied were, um, were dry this year. However, you know, the hope is that this is a functioning metapopulation. So as those sites fill back up with water in a future monsoon season, they will be recolonized by frogs. So our current progress as far as the recovery criteria, and this is um, range-wide. Um, so we do have just one recovery unit that does meet that criteria of having two metapopulations in different drainages and one isolated robust population. And that recovery unit is recovery unit one in southern Arizona. And that's what you see here on this map. So the blue circles outline um, the existing metapopulations. And then the yellow circle is uh, kind of an up and coming metapopulation. And then the site up north that's outlined in purple is the isolated robust population. <clears throat> So despite the fact that we just have one recovery unit that is meeting this criteria, we do have breeding and dispersing populations among other recovery units throughout Arizona and New Mexico. In the northern parts of the range in Arizona and New Mexico, we have 
um, had a much harder time getting populations to stick following reintroductions. And that may be related to um, colder weather in the winter. So um, more susceptibility to BD in those populations. So despite multiple partners actively involved in juvenile leopard frog management and pretty significant progress towards recovery of the species, um, long-term persistence of Chiricahua leopard frogs across the, the range does remain tenuous without intensive conservation and management. So for the next part of this talk, I'm going to just kind of get into what's next and what our challenges are that remain. So the Chiricahua leopard frog captive population um, uh, that we've got in various um, facilities in Arizona and New Mexico may be the most significant achievement towards recovery of the species. And um, what we have kind of done is, you know, putting frogs out onto the ground, um, regardless of, you know, BD status or other um, conditions that might negatively affect those frogs. And so we are now working with partners at USGS who are analyzing our survey data and eDNA, so environmental DNA data, to analyze factors that might be important in um, getting a population to successfully you know, remain on the ground after doing releases. And so they're looking at factors like time of year releases, um, life stage or, or size class of frogs, that we're putting out onto the ground and then presence of invasive species. And so hopefully that will allow us to increase the efficacy of our reintroduction program. Challenges that remain, um, BD is definitely still a challenge. Um, there is some hope. Um, there has been some recent research that found that Chiricahua leopard frogs um, do have the MHC allele that might provide some um, uh, immunity protection from BD. Um, we know that some populations in Arizona and New Mexico can exist with BD without um, large-scale die-offs. And so we continue to release Chiricahua leopard frogs out onto the landscape regardless of um, whether a site has BD or not um, in the hopes that, you know, in the future natural selection will work towards um, creating a Chiricahua leopard frog that um, can persist with BD. And then there are other pathogens that we know nothing about or very little about here in the Southwest. So ranavirus um, is known from the Southwest. We have not detected FV3, but we know that ATV or Ambistema tigrinum virus is here. And um, we are currently funding a project to look at seasonal dynamics of ATV in our systems and what effects um, those might have on Chiricahua leopard frogs. Bullfrog removal um, is continuing to be a challenge um, despite clear successes where we've had Chiricahua leopard frogs recolonize after bullfrog removal. Um, continued success is going to be, is going to require constant management of those buffer zones to make sure that bullfrogs don't reinvade and um, kind of negate all of our successes that we've had. And we need to get long-term funding for bullfrog removal because we know that as long as we will be managing Chiricahua leopard frogs, we will also be managing bullfrogs. And um, one of our major impediments to bullfrog control is um, lack of buy-in from private landowners. Another challenge that we have is, um, you know, we don't know how best to improve habitats. There might be some component about a habitat that makes it, um, uh, makes it easier for frogs to persist with BD um, or might make them more susceptible to BD. So we have a question about how, um, how does habitat affects frogs' ability to overcome it. And um, furthermore, we will need to be providing more permanent sources of water on the landscape given climate change, bringing hotter, drier conditions, and changes in timing of precipitation here in the Southwest. 
So I talked about our existing monitoring, which includes visual and counter surveys, but we do not have a monitoring program that allows us to really accurately analyze um, long-term population dynamics um, throughout the range. And so we don't have any sort of cogent assessment of you know, what's happening with the species range-wide. Um, we have gen genetic information needs. Um, we know that, you know, we're probably experiencing loss of heterozygosity because we have many small isolated, isolated populations, both in the wild and in captivity. And so we're in need of a genetic management plan that would address those needs. And then we're always looking for new strategies to manage ongoing threats. Um, and finally, we need to increase our collaboration range wide, um, that includes both between Arizona and New Mexico, and then also in Mexico, where we know, you know, little to nothing about the status of the species there. So these are kind of my final conclusions um, for the talk. Um, you know, this has not been a small scale effort. <laughs> this has been going on for, for several decades now. Um, and the number of frogs and tadpoles and egg masses that we've released or translocate, translocated has been quite large. And again, these numbers are just for Arizona. Um, and then we've also removed hundreds of thousands of bullfrogs and their tadpoles across southern Arizona. A lot of people say hope is not a strategy, but in this case, it, it kind of has been um, because we have done so many releases onto the ground, um, but not really knowing you know, what factors are important in making uh, a successful reintroduction. So we need that research to let us know how we can increase our efficiency in the captive propagation program and that reintroduction program. Partnerships have been really critical to success of where we are now. Um, partnerships have been important in getting funding sources for habitat restorations, for bullfrog removal, um, and then also partnerships with our captive facilities, the Phoenix Zoo, the Ladder Ranch, and then um, also I didn't mention this before, but the Fort Worth Zoo um, works with the New Mexico population of Chiricahua leopard frogs for captive propagation. And it's important to note that the, the activities that we're doing for Chiricahua leopard frogs, which include you know, the bullfrog removal, and the increasing permanency of water on the landscape doesn't just benefit the frog, it also benefits multiple species. And we've been able to get funding for some of our water projects from our game program here at Arizona Game and Fish. So a program that would normally be funding projects for turkey, elk, deer, are interested in restoring a riparian area because that benefits all species. So bullfrog removal um, will be, again, never ending as long as we are um, working towards the recovery of Chiricahua leopard frogs. Um, and then, you know, even after um, the species meets the recovery criteria, um, bullfrog removal is going to be a never ending management. And there's a need for long-term funding. And, you know, I think in final conclusion, recovery does take a lot of time, um, but we are, moving the ball forward.